Hi, welcome to the House Bill 3834 Cybersecurity Awareness Training Video. Uh, we've partnered at Triton Consulting to administer the program for special purpose districts in conjunction with Red Tiger Security to deliver the curriculum specially tailored for you. As you may know, the 86th legislative session of the state of Texas passed House Bill 3834. This requires all elected officials to have completed a cybersecurity awareness training uh, curriculum. We have assembled this with Red Tiger Security and today to instruct on the curriculum we have Jonathan Polay from Red Tiger Security that I'd like to introduce now. Hi, thank you David. Yes, this is Jonathan Polay with Red Tiger Security and I'm a degree electrical engineer with 20 years of experience in industrial automation controls and cybersecurity. Uh, our firm has created a lot of cybersecurity training since 2009 and that's the reason why we partnered with Triton Consulting to create this cybersecurity training awareness program for you guys. Okay, before we jump into the, the training, let's look at a quick overview of the topics we're going to cover. Uh, we split up this one hour course into two sections. The first section is going to give you an explanation of cybersecurity terms and definitions. We're going to go over CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We're also going to look at what the term information security means, and also different forms and locations of information and the people that are responsible for safeguarding those things. Um, the second half of the first part of the course is going to jump into safeguarding unauthorized ac uh, access to information, information systems, and secure facilities, and some best practices for securing that information, both from a physical perspective and a cyber perspective. The second half of the course, we're going to dive a little deeper uh, into what actually constitutes a cybersecurity attack. What needs to be in place in, in order for your systems to be compromised? We're going to look at terms like threats, vulnerabilities, and exploits. I know these terms sound very similar, but we're going to break them down for you to understand how a threat can take an exploit to overtake a vulnerable system. Uh, we're going to model several different threat actors so you can understand the types of threats that are out there and some, some of their motivation while they might be interested in the information that you guys are supposed to be safeguarding. Uh, we're also going to look at risk and risk platforms. So uh, securing information properly is a main part of all cyber risk platforms. We're going to look at the NIST cybersecurity framework because that is a framework that applies to all critical sectors including wastewater and water treatment. And uh, lastly we look at when you do uh, uh, detect a threat to your system, what are the proper ways to respond and recover your operations from that threat? So let's start with section 1.1, Principles of Information Security. So the NIST publication 800-12 is an interesting read. It's available on the NIST website for free download, and it defines cybersecurity as the protection of what is an automated information system in order to obtain the applicable objectives of preserving the integrity, availability, and confidentiality of not only the information, but the systems and hardware that are uh, part of that system, including also telecommunications, which is the transmission of that data from its source to its definition, to its destination. And in terms of uh, securing information, uh, Confidentiality, integrity, and availability are always uh, defined as the pillars of security. And uh, those three areas of security are what we want to break down for you. First, look, let's look at integrity. Integrity has two facets, data integrity and system integrity. And it, you can think of integrity as uh, making sure that the data does not change from its source to its destination. So if you think about this like, let's say a water meter on the side of your house. The water meter data is registering how much water you're consuming and that data needs to uh, remain the same from the meter all the way through the telecommunications infrastructure to the back-end billing systems to your invoice. If that system does not have integrity, that means someone has been able to alter that data in between the source and the destination. And so integrity is, is one of the three main pillars of security. We're also going to look at availability, and availability make, is, is a, a term we apply to a system to make sure that it's available to the people that want to use the system. It's not available to those who want to take advantage of the system. And you want to have a, a system with high availability so that the users have access to the system and its data. So confidentiality 
is another form of the three pillars that form up uh, information security. And uh, the reason why we want to have a system with high confidentiality is to make sure those that do not have a need to know do not have access to that data. So let's look at confidentiality, integrity, and availability in terms of what we want to prevent. Okay, so we use confidentiality to prevent information from being disclosed to third parties that shouldn't have access to that information. We use integrity to ensure that the data or information does not change from its source to its destination. And the reason we want to have a system with high availability is to make sure that it's not obliviated, that it's available for use for those who need to access it. So in terms of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, uh, those three concepts are applied to business IT systems differently than they're applied to real-time critical uh, infrastructure systems. For example, if you have a banking system or a business system, confidentiality of the information is the most important feature. So if, if a, a record of someone's salary is compromised, you immediately lock down the system, find out how the data leak happened, and then restore the system back to normal use. Uh, on a real-time system, if confidentiality is compromised, you can't shut off the system. You know, power systems, water systems, airport runway systems have to be up all the time. So availability is the highest, uh, most critical point in the system. And so by understanding uh, the differences between business IT systems and industrial control systems and real-time systems, you can understand how these three areas of confidentiality, integrity, and availability play in making sure the systems are always available to those that need to use it. Uh, the term information security applies to a whole framework uh, to secure uh, not just the data, but the processes, methodologies involved to secure it. And the SANS Institute brought us this, this definition of information security. So uh, it, it goes more be, uh, than just making sure a piece of paper is put in a locked uh, cabinet, for example. It goes, information security is more than just having a firewall, more than just having an antivirus program. It's the whole process around how you secure information. Uh, also, information security is part of every single risk framework. We give you one here for reference. This is the NIST cybersecurity framework. This was created in partnership with, uh, between the White House and NIST in 2014, and it's been used in every critical infrastructure sector since then. Uh, and the NIST framework uh, indicates that you should have security controls that cover these five functional areas. So first, you need to be able to identify those parts of your assets, your information that's important to you that needs to be protected, that you manage those assets properly, you have proper governance over those assets, and you have a strategy around how to manage risk for those assets. And then you also need to put protective controls in place to prevent uh, unauthorized access to that system or to that information, provide awareness and training to those people who are working in those fields that are uh, responsible for protecting that information. In fact, this training uh, falls into place under awareness and training. And then uh, also need to maintain the protection levels on the system. Now, what happens uh, if those protection levels are defeated? And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. We need to be able to detect that the system has an abnormal incident, has occurred, and then you need to be prepared to respond correctly to that incident, have re response plans prepared, and the proper people trained so that they understand what to do and how to respond to an incident. And then finally, how to recover operations uh, back to normal use after the incident. So these five areas uh, are, are the main functional areas that are included in all information security programs. And uh, this, this goes to show you that information security is, is a very wide and broad subject. And uh, we're gonna give you a light one hour overview of this. One of the main uh, things that needs to be communicated through this training is first of all, how to identify what types of information in your workplace uh, should be secured and some best practices around securing that information. So first of all, we need to have an, an inventory of your assets. Uh, you need to be able to understand your assets and have an, an inventory of not only your, your systems, your hardware, your software, but also the most important uh, data that lives on those systems and classify that information. Uh, we're going to go through 
the next couple of slides some ways to classify information because it's going to range from highly confidential all the way down to public. And so you need to figure out what parts of the information in your organization are confidential and what is not confidential. Once you classify your information, then you need to label the information and then understand how to handle that information properly. So here's some types of information. This is just a short little list of them. This is not include, conclusive of all types of information. But let's say you have employment records, salaries, uh, maybe there's health information if you work in that field, background checks for employees. Uh, these are things that you know may not, should, should probably not be seen by everyone in the organization or certainly not everyone on the internet. Uh, credit card information, emergency planning information. These are types of information that should probably be classified and then we'll tell you different ways to classify this information. In order to break down this classification of data and information for your industry, I'm going to ask David to come back up and talk a little bit. Uh, as Jonathan was pointing out, uh, the information in your organization, being public sector, is going to be slightly different than what a normal business private sector organization uh, would use. Uh, and for most public sector, the majority of your records are going to be public records, so if they are compromised, while it is uh, misappropriation of data, it's not necessarily sensitive the majority of the time. Uh, there are exceptions to this, of course. Uh, a a high-end confidential item uh, that may be executive level only or senior management, for public sector, you could consider executive session items or anything that's attorney-client privilege to, to fall into that, uh, the topmost classification. Uh, there may be some records in between access codes to your facilities that your operators may use and your engineers may use, which is not necessarily attorney-client, but it's not public record either. Uh, but these are some things to keep in mind when you're uh, setting policies uh, for uh, labeling the classifications of the sensitivity of your information. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, so if you are the approved custodian of the information, then uh, you're the person responsible for its protection. And you must safeguard this information at all times to ensure that the data is not lost or compromised uh, or duplicated without your understanding. Unauthorized disclosure of classified information is punishable under federal crime statutes or, or organized uh, policies. So that's why it's important to understand your role in the organization and what it takes to secure that information. So with that, let's go into some best practices for securing information, not just the, on paper, but also in digital form as well. So here are some examples of safeguarding information. Uh, classified material, should not be taken home because there is no way to ensure that your home has the, the same safeguards as your workplace. Uh, you must not work on classified information at home. Class, classified information shall not be disposed in the wastebasket. It has to be shredded. Um, also, email and internet may create an opportunities for inadvertent disclosure of information. So uh, before you send an email, before you post information to an online forum, uh, make sure that, that you put through your own mindset that is this data for public use or should it be classified or restricted. And also be familiar with your own organization's policies about internet use. If you have certain classified working papers such as notes, rough drafts, uh, and you're working on them, when you're not at your desk they do need to be locked up. Um, you can't just leave them in open, an open area. There's other forms of, or places where information can be stored, such as computer disks, CDs, DVDs, USB sticks, even on paper formats, such as carbon paper, or even old typewriter reference, if you're working on really ancient, <laughs> ancient systems. All these pose as an opportunity to, uh, for a data leak, and uh, we need to make sure that data that lives on those things have been classified and they're being handled properly. Uh, you know, some offices treat all items uh, as classified, even though they're not necessary at the same level. Uh, also, uh, we need to talk about uh, the use of computers and communications and the internet. Your, your own um, organization probably has a policy. Uh, make sure to follow your own organization's guidelines around that. If you don't have an uh, organizational policy, uh, you need to make sure to adopt one that fits your organization. Uh, when that information is no longer usable, and uh, we also need, we're going to talk about destruction of media. 
Um, so you can't just take a USB stick that you're using that had classified information and just toss it in the trash or hand it to someone else. So later in the slides, we're going to talk about the proper destruction of media. And then, uh, but before we get started into segments and segments and controls, I'd like to have David come up and talk to you about how uh, layering these physicals and cyber controls can be related to your industry. So as Jonathan mentioned, uh, your type of controls that you would have in your facility and location will vary depending upon what sector you're in. So if you're private sector, some of this would be a little different than public sector. So if you're public sector, for instance, uh, you guys would have maybe an administrative building, maybe it's a critical infrastructure like a wastewater treatment plant, a water plant, lift stations, etc. And so when it comes to uh, safeguarding those assets, there's, uh, there's two facets to it. There's physical access and logical access. So physical access controls would be uh, you know, access to the facility itself and logical would be a, any digital access. Uh, so for instance, uh, let's say this is a, uh, a treatment plan of some sort. You have your perimeter, which would be uh, your uh, alarm system with sensors on it. Uh, this could be your uh, security camera system and your DVR system that's uh, monitoring the external perimeters of the area. Uh, and then there's different layers on top of that. For instance, uh, there's the perimeter controls. Uh, once your access to the facility is granted, you're in through the gates and uh, an interior control would be maybe a control room where you have shift access or biometric access or keyed access that uh, an operations or management company or a vendor might be accessing. And then a segmented interior control would be uh, inside of the control room, maybe you have a server cabinet with a keyed access to it. So that would be some, uh, some public sector examples of some of these uh, segregations of uh, access controls. And so more specifically, when we talk about cybersecurity controls, there's different layers in that, and I'm going to defer to uh, Jonathan here to go into details on that. Thank you, David, for a good breakdown and the physical controls. Um, just as he talked about, where you're gonna have layers between like you know, your outer fence, locking the building, then locking the inner rooms or safes within the room. Uh, network security and cybersecurity also has a layered defense and depth approach. So if there's specific data information that lives within an application that's been installed on a workstation or server that's attached to a network, all of those layers will have uh, various means of securing access to those, to those layers. For example, if you're on the internet, you're going to have to go through a firewall or VPN probably a remote access token to get onto your interior network. And then once you're on that network, you'll have to log into a specific workstation or server and then open up an application, which probably will, will also ask you to log on as an operator or as an engineer or as a supervisor, then to access the data that lives within that application. So that's another example of a layered defense approach. Now, storing information is different than protecting access to that information. And we're going to talk about storing information and how that's different, both physical and logical, as you go between these different uh, information security la layers. So, for example, the top confidential layer for uh, information security, uh, critical information that's been labeled as critical can never be kept out in public places. Uh, you can't keep a critical uh, drawing of a plant or a network drawing of a server farm or your network architecture on a wall in your building. Um, you can't let, leave it where individuals that may not have access, that should have access to it, can inadvertently see it. Uh, so only the, the physical security controls have to be down to the only the, the individual that can actually see it. Okay, so that's the highest level of, of confidentiality. Uh, when you get down to restricted level, um, this is where a group of people would have access to the information. So uh, you can leave information in a certain room where that group of people have access to. Um, you can, uh, but you must store it in, in secured rooms or secured cabinets or safes where that group of people have the codes to the safes or that group of people have a key to that cabinet. Okay, so uh, you can't store information out in the public if it's restricted. For internal use, the information can be kept inside the building, it can be put on the walls, uh, it can be left on a table inside the building as long as the building itself is locked away from the public. And then anything deemed public use can be left outside if you want, anywhere. For logically securing information, let's break down the same levels. 
So confidential information can never be stored on servers that can be accessed by the general public. Uh, they cannot be put on servers that can be accessed by your own internal employees even. Uh, so confidential data must be secured down to a role-based access control that only specific individuals can access. Uh, confidential information stored on portable media such as USB sticks, um, hard drives, portable hard drives, um, those have to be secured with a password protection so that down to the individual level and it should be encrypted uh, so that only that individual that has a password can access that data. Those same basic rules also apply to the restricted level. Uh, however, those um, levels of protection, such as passwords, can be shared by a group, whatever group can, can be deemed uh, that has access to that restricted information. When we get down to internal use, internal use information can be stored on your uh, company's intro web, uh, could be put on your file print servers, as long as an internal employee or vetted contractor can access that information. So it's only one level up from the public, and then uh, information that is deemed public use can be even stored up on a portal directly on the internet. Next we need to talk about how to dispose of information that has been classified higher than public use. So let's first talk about printed information. So printed information that's been classified at any level above public must be disposed in a way that the general public cannot access it. When we talk about logical ways of disposing information, this gets a little bit more complicated. Okay, so media that was used for storing confidential information must be disposed in a very specific way. Not only do you have to format the drive, but you, almost, you also have to damage the physical media so that it cannot be restored to use, which means drilling through the hard drive with a power drill or throwing it into a fire. You have to damage the media so that it can never ever be retrieved off that device. Uh, restricted uh, information and media used to store that information uh, can be disposed in the trash. Uh, it has to be formatted and over wiped with zeros. So more than just a basic format, you have to do a, a three-pass overwrite with zero format of the drive. Um, also, you should not resell internal hardware used to store uh, critical or restricted information on eBay or Amazon because even though that drive has been formatted, uh, someone else who purchased that drive might be able to use data retrieval tools to retrieve that information that was once stored on that drive. Uh, media used for storing internal use information can be disposed of in working order, but should be formatted. And um, also after formatting, the hardware should be disposed in the trash, should not be resold to others. And then media used for storing public use information can be, uh, can be uh, thrown away in the trash, can be disposed, can be resold. There's no uh, limits on what you do with media uh, when you're, you're done using it when it's deemed public use. Let's jump into the second half of the course. Uh, we're, and we're going to start with uh, defining terms such as threats, vulnerabilities, exploits, and also break down how a cyber incident happens. So let's start with the cyber security attack triangle. A lot of you guys probably remember back uh, in your safety videos about the fire triangle where uh, in order to have a combustion you need to have oxygen, heat, and fuel. And we're going to try to relate that to a cyber attack. And so in order to have a cyber attack, you must have a threat that uses an exploit to take advantage of a vulnerable system. If those three are present, then a cyber attack can happen. And so uh, we don't always have the ability to um, stop threats, um, but we do have the ability to uh, modify the vulnerabilities in our system and also limit uh, exploits from reaching those systems. So if we take any leg of these fire triangle out, the fire is mitigated, the same principle applies with cybersecurity. So um, we're going to break down these concepts of threats, vulner vulnerabilities, and exploits and uh, so that you can understand how to best res restrict uh, these threats from uh, accessing your information. Let's start with threats. Threats are typically either a people or an organization 
Um, they have a certain type of motivation in mind, uh, which we're going to get into when we talk about modeling threats. Uh, vulnerabilities are deficiencies in the security of a system. It could be a vulnerability in a firewall, vulnerability in an application, vulnerability in a server. It could be even a vulnerability in a process that you're doing that involves people and procedures. Um, exploits are created by threats who take advantage of vulnerabilities. So I know these three terms sound, may sound similar if you're not used to this industry, but remember that exploits are created by threats to take advantage of vulnerabilities. Also, the likelihood of a vulnerability getting exploited combined with the possible result or impact to the infrastructure is the risk. And we're also going to break down uh, the term risk later in this slide deck as well for you. So let's look at these three aspects of the cyber attack triangle. Threats can never fully be mitigated. You know, uh, there's always going to be another hacker out there. There's always going to be another group trying to uh, attack something. Um, so we don't really have a lot of control over threats. The threats are always going to be out there. But we can understand threat motivation. So um, we're going to go through a little threat diagram uh, later in the slides to kind of break that down for you. Uh, vulnerabilities um, can either be mitigated, uh, they can be eliminated, they can be reduced, they can be managed. Vulnerabilities cannot, but vulnerabilities can never be transferred, which means those vulnerabilities are always on your systems. And mitigating vulnerabilities is where we have the biggest area of control in our system. We also cannot stop exploits. You know, there's always going to be another exploit being developed. Uh, we're going to break down uh, kind of the methodology around why there's an exploit uh, uh, ecosystem out there. And the chance of an exploit being successful can also be reduced through deterrence or detectors. So basically we want to harden the system strong enough so that um, you know, a motivated threat will take its exploit tools to you know, the next potential victim. Um, and that's, that's really where we can reduce the chance of an exploit hitting your system. In computer security, a threat is a possible danger that might exploit a vulnerability to breach security and cause harm. Uh, threats can either be internal to your organization or could be external. Uh, threats could also um, uh, have a, a, a threat to your system could usually be natural, could be man-made. Uh, in the case of cyber attacks, threat is typically a human or a group of humans working together to steal information or cause a cyber incident to a targeted system. Here's a typical threat classification tree. So whenever there's an incident, uh, there's a team that's brought in typically to, to uh, determine how the threat got in and how to uh, restore operations quickly and one of the first things that's done is to try to classify uh, what type of threat was involved with the attack. Uh, typically there's two, uh, like we said before, either an internal threat agent or an external threat agent that uh, could either be an employee of the organization or a contractor and uh, the threat could either uh, happen accidentally or intentionally. So uh, you could have, for example, an employee that uh, downloaded the wrong program uh, to a controller in a water plant. You know, that would be an incident that, would, that was caused by an employee that was accidental and it was an internal. Okay, you could also have you know, malware that uh, hit a server on your business system and it started eating files uh, because it was ransomware and now they were trying to hold you ransom for money. Uh, that would be an external source, non-specific, that was prop, uh, propagating through the internet and it opportunistically found its way to your machine. So by understanding this uh, threat classification, we can break down uh, where, that, where that incident started. Okay, so as you can see that uh, classifying threats allows us to understand their motivation, the motivation behind a cyber incident. Now the threat motivation has also changed over time. Now if you go back to the uh, the early times, 70s, 80s, 90s, a lot of these hackers were trying to 
uh, do this for fun as a hobby. They're trying to see how they could break a system or change a system. For example, some hackers even found out how to take a floppy disk and to put a hole punch in the other side and make it double-sided so they're getting better use out of a, of a system. And so the motivation was mostly curiosity. Uh, we had a lot of hobbyists that were hacking in this time. Uh, when we start in the early 2000 years, uh, we started to see hacktivism where uh, different groups were hacking for a cause. Uh, then as the second half of the, 2000, or the first decade of 2000s came upon us, we started to see the motivation switch more around a monetization. Uh, and so a lot of uh, hackers were putting themselves out as hackers for hire. And then as we see from 2011 onward, almost all cyber incidents now has either been political or uh, money motivated. And so we're gonna break down a couple of incidents for you so you can learn about how these have happened in the, in the past. Uh, this is an incident that happened to a power generation company in the U.S. Um, their NTP server was compromised and used as a spam relay. And uh, when we did the, the, the threat breakdown tree for this, this was an accidental uh, mistake by an internal employee. So a well-meaning employee uh, basically wanted to um, connect his server to a good use of time and why not use the internet because it's the best use of it's the best source for atomic clock and all of his time systems will be synced properly well by bypassing the firewall and allowing NTP protocol to get access directly from the internet uh, what that did was allow um, the spam bots that, that are going around the internet to find his server and then take over the server, turn it into a spam relay, and start spamming out email to a, a, you know, on behalf of the spamming group. Uh, and so, uh, since that server was also used in, in the operations control room, then the operator started having slower refresh rates, there was bandwidth issues, uh, the spamming server also was blacklisted by uh, the domains, the domains uh, DNS servers, so the company didn't have email either. So this was a very large incident that was uh, just done by a well-meaning employee that was an accident. Uh, so I'm going to give you a couple of little examples um, that should help you understand why following procedures, handling information properly, and making sure you're aware of these threats can help prevent these incidents from happening in your organization. Here's another example that happened uh, in 2010. Uh, there was a, a series of incidents uh, where data was being leaked from uh, pipeline companies and uh, chemical plants and processing facilities. Uh, this, was a, this was a series of attacks that were all done the same exact way, so it was called a campaign. Uh, some of the oil and gas companies and the chemical companies, pipeline companies, uh, did not know they were under attack uh, even after a year and a half of the attack being uh, on, underway. Uh, and, and so uh, what these threat actors were after were executive emails, uh, plant blueprints, ID diagrams, uh, network diagrams, basically trying to get their hands on anything that would allow them to learn about how these systems work, you know, how to actually manage an oil and gas company. Uh, how to build their own chemical processing plant, how to run a water treatment facility, for example. Um, in, in one of these cases, the purchase of a Chinese onshore processing facility was undercut by another company using the stolen emails and the financial data. So the motivation here was purely for competitive advantage. So um, a lot of times people will wonder, you know, uh, why would someone want the information I have? Uh, and that's not always the, the, the best question to ask yourself because the, the better question to ask is how can I best secure this information so that no one else can access that information regardless of their motivation. In this case, uh, this organization has had ineffective firewall configuration. They were not logging access to the firewall. They didn't have centralized logging and they, they had a lack of security awareness within their organization. So that's how they were able to go for 18 months without detecting this threat agent. Now, in addition to your typical you know, firewalls and business systems and uh, workstations and servers, we also need to worry about our phones. And uh, all of us walk around with our own smartphones in our pocket. 
but we need to realize that um, now a lot of the threats are moving into the mobile space. Uh, ever since uh, 2012, uh, we've had over 2,000 apps that were removed from the Android marketplace because they had Trojans that, basically what a Trojan is, is an application that appears to be one thing, but it's actually used in a way to subvert the information. This is, the, uh, this is an example of a Trojan application called Bowling Time. So if you downloaded this game onto your phone and played it, you can move your phone around, you could actually bowl and it plays the game. But while it's playing the game, the app is also uh, digging into the other apps on your phone and sending out information outbound to the compromised server of the people who run this app. Uh, basically taking uh, your, your username and passwords to you know, Facebook, Instagram, your, your bank account access, anything that your phone can access, this app was accessing and sending it to the uh, owners of the app. Um, and the name of this was called Joy Dream. And this is just one of many. So uh, basically what we're trying to reinforce is that if you use a smartphone uh, within your organization and you access uh, critical information for your job, make sure you follow your own workplace policies for uh, the uh, applicable use and effective use of the smartphone and, uh, for, your, for your business. And uh, be uh, careful about the applications that you download and run on your phone. And there's other threat vectors that uh, these threat agents will use to access uh, and compromise information. Uh, lately it's been malware worms, ransomware, uh, phishing attacks. Uh, a phishing attack is when a, a, a threat agent or organization will send in an email into an organization pretending to be one thing, such as like maybe they might send the email saying, hey, join this new wellness program or this uh, going green program within the organization. And you click on it, maybe there's a, 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 a raffle to win a free iPad or something, right? Uh, you have to kind of be uh, a, a little bit leery when you're looking at emails these days. Um, you know, if you're the back of your hair, your spidey sensor standing up, it doesn't look right. Uh, you know, don't proceed and click on links because sometimes just clicking on the link will open up a portal on your system outbound to the internet where the threat actor can get back onto your machine remotely. Uh, there's also uh, PDF files that can have droppers in. Uh, attached to the PDF file. So even just opening up a, a Word document or a PDF document machine could be a part of a phishing attack. So make sure you validate where those emails are coming from and the individuals that are sending those to you. You know, mobile devices, we talked about smartphones, iPads, USB drives. You know, if, if you find a USB stick somewhere lying around the office, or let's say you, fi you find one in the lobby or you find one in a parking lot somewhere and you don't know the source of that USB stick, uh, don't plug it into your home computer, don't plug it into your work computer. You should report that to the person in your organization that's responsible for information security so she can test that device. Um, also, uh, threat actors are using insecure builds, devices that are misconfigured or un unpatched before activation. Uh, this gets into uh, installation of hardware in your environment without being secured first. So, uh, for example, if you uh, buy a webcam or uh, a security system, maybe one of those little door things you put on your door to your house, or even uh, a Nest thermostat, you know, all these things go outbound to the internet. You shouldn't just take those things out of the package, plug it in, turn it on, and start using it without doing your own research to properly harden and lock down those things. So when it comes to phishing attempts and other uh, exploits and vulnerabilities, one of them that's more common among our industry would be attachments that come via your email. Uh, so anytime you get an email in and it, it's from a trusted st source, still look at what type of file it is. Uh, be mindful of the suffixes. For those of you who don't know, it's the, the letters that come after the dot at the end of the file name. You can usually see them. Uh, some of them, they, they all have a certain meaning. They identify with a specific file type. More often than not, you're gonna see PDFs, which is the standard portable digital files that we use for agendas and meeting minutes and materials that'll come in uh, for public sector meetings. But if you see anything that looks unusual or suspicious, double check who it came from, maybe reach out to the originator of the email and say, hey, is this what you meant to send me before you go opening them? 
Uh, an exe file, for instance, is a is a is an application that will run and that can do just about anything at once half the time. So, uh, those are some things to be mindful of digitally. Uh, also, be mindful for physical files that come in. If it's even if something as simple as uh, a, a fake uh, water testing kit that comes in from the water company, I've seen these come in before, and uh, many of you may have as well. Uh, they appear to be something coming from the local water entity that's real generic looking. Uh, these are not generally uh, trusted sources and they normally are, are meant to uh, subvert uh, even residential water customers. So as a, in, in, as a elected official, be mindful of what comes in digitally and what some of your uh, constituents may be getting physically as well. The dry doctors are, are starting to uh, increase their, their game and uh, in fact, I'm gonna go through this as a quick example. The chief intelligence analyst for the control system cyber program at DHS said that uh, on a daily basis, the US is being targeted. And in fact, they're targeting utilities a lot. She went to 17 different cities last year as uh, she presented these statistics to various utilities. And she broke down the attackers into three types. So first is the garden variety hacker, you know, out for a thrill. Um, you know, the second is the daily assault of viruses, worms, and botnet attacks. You know, this, this is never going to go away, okay? We're, we've always had this to deal with, and it's going to increase in the future. For example, if you take an unpatched uh, Windows server uh, and stand it up and plug it into your network without patching it, without installing uh, its internal firewall and locking it down, the typical statistics is that within nine minutes, it will collect a bot and actually start to be owned by someone else on the internet. That's just because these bots are automated and all, always going on the internet looking for open systems. So, so these two are always gonna be here, okay? Um, the third and most concerning type of attack is a nation state attack, uh, attackers who are well-funded and they've got a certain mission in mind to, to either subvert a system to learn about it to harvest its information and to build its own competitive advantage, uh, or to have this uh, access to the system so that a physical cyber attack can be pulled off in the future. Um, so uh, we wanted to break this uh, down for you so that you understand that you know when you're dealing with this information on a day-to-day -day basis, you may not think that it's that important to secure this information because it's the same benign information you're seeing every day on your and when you're doing your job. However, by exposing you to what's, go what's going on out, um, out there in the real world, you'll understand that there's a, a lot of people motivated uh, that may want to access that information for their own uh, purposes. So that's why it's important to understand each element of a cyber attack. We first talked about threats. We said those threats aren't going away. They're always gonna be there. We need to understand their motivation. Uh, hopefully the slides we went through opened your mind to the type of, a threat, type of threats that are out there. Uh, next, let's jump into vulnerabilities because this is where we have the biggest chance to uh, prevent an attack. And in computer security, a vulnerability is a weakness which can be exploited by a threat actor to perform unauthorized actions within a computer program. Uh, most vulnerabilities are due to unpatched systems, misconfigured systems, you know, outdated firmware. Uh, so this would, this would be devices that were essentially bought off the shelf, put in your environment and not maintained properly, or systems that aren't getting patched on a regular on a regular basis. To exploit the vulnerability, an attacker must have at least one applicable tool or technique that can connect to a system weakness, and all it takes is one weak link in the chain. I'm going to give you a couple of typical vulnerabilities that we see out there, and uh, these are things that probably exist in your organization, so you can learn from these. Uh, flat internal networks not segmented into separate subnets. That would be, uh, for example, what if you had um, you know, uh, a building where there was no fence to, before you get into the building. The building doors were always left open and there were no locked doors within the building. So basically anyone from the public outside can walk directly into the building, into any room they want in the building. That's how some computer networks are set up. Um, sometimes a computer network is not segmented properly with firewalls and access controls and once you get onto their internal network you can access all the systems within the internal network uh, with the same level of access. So uh, this would, some mistakes we find is when people would connect their PBX system their, or their voice system 
to the same computer network as their email, to the same computer network that has their internal security cameras, and the same system has their uh, sensitive file and print servers, all on the same flight network. So once you get onto their internal network, you have access to everything. Uh, so that would be a, a, a vulnerability. Uh, internal servers uh, might have a modem or a backdoor. Uh, maybe it has a remote access uh, to that server for uh, contractors to access that server and, and that remote access has not been secured properly. Uh, maybe there's internal servers that all share the same uh, username and password. So let's say you've got three or four facilities out there and using the same three letters of the name of your organization as the login and the password for every computer that's at every site. That would also be a vulnerability. Um, easy to guess passwords would be another one. You know, um, application protocols are also oftentimes in clear text without authentication or encryption. Uh, so these are just a, a few of the vulnerabilities that we see out there. Uh, having an effective vulnerability management program is important. Uh, asking your uh, employer or your organization about how they effectively manage uh, vulnerabilities is also important and following vulnerability management policies. So this is why you may get a little pop-up on your desk from time to time that a patch is being downloaded or an antivirus is being updated. Uh, it's because that routine uh, health hygiene of that system to keep it patched, keep it updated, is going to prevent these vulnerabilities from developing on the system. Uh, let's now move into exploits because uh, we can't have a lot of impact over the threats. We, we definitely can reduce the number of vulnerabilities in a system by understanding how exploits work. We can also reduce the chance of an exploit hitting our system through deterrence and detectors. So an exploit is a piece of software. Uh, it could be malware, it could be um, a software that a hacker writes himself, or it could be a bug that the, the hacker uh, buys from an exploit website. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Exploit Hub and these sites where you can buy and sell exploits. Um, but ex an exploit is essentially a program, a piece of software that, um, is, it, that is used by a threat to take over our vulnerability. And why is there such a big uh, issue, an ongoing issue with exploits and threats and cyber attacks seem to be going up and up and up each year? And that's because the uh, exploits have been monetized, right? So we have nation states that are willing to pay very large sums of money for well-written exploits. The highest one I've seen go for has been over $250,000 that a nation state paid for one piece of software. Uh, we have the underground world that's still buying and selling exploits and selling that into the cr criminal space. Uh, we have corporations such as HP, uh, Google, Facebook, almost all major uh, corporations now will purchase exploits from hackers uh, through bug bounty programs. So basically in order to ensure their systems are secure, they'll say, hey guys, you go bang away at our systems and if you find an exploit in Google Mail, for example, or if you find an exploit um, you know, in, in a, a Facebook app and no one else has found it before, we're going to give you, you know, a certain amount of money, $20,000, $30,000. Big United just had the bug bounty program where a hacker found a vulnerability in the entertainment system and they awarded him one million United miles for finding it. So they're trying to put like some rewards in for hackers to come forward with their exploits instead of selling it on these <coughs> back market channels. Um, so we have brokers, we have researchers and buyers. So it's a very layered system. And there's websites like Exploit Hub, which is similar to StubHub. So I know where if you if you've missed the chance to, to buy a concert ticket, you can buy it from someone else and it connects buyers and sellers to each other. Well, Exploit Hub connects exploit writers, hackers that are writing exploit code, to exploit buyers who want to purchase that code and use it for their nefarious reasons. And so there's a lot of reasons why you know, the Benjamins keep flowing into this space, and it's because the exploit field has been monetized. Now, the effect or the impact of exploits can be minimized through detection and uh, defense mechanisms. So like we said before, you, you're, we're never going to stop the exploit uh, world from generating more exploits every day. 
uh, but we can do some things on the inside of our organizations to detect a potential exploit from, and, and respond appropriately. And uh, we're going to look at two types of deterrences, uh, an active defense and passive detection. So uh, let's break this down in a way that we can all understand it. Uh, on my way here to uh, record this training session for you, for example, you know, I locked the car, my car, and I set the alarm on my car, right? So the physical lock on my car is an, an act of deterrence. When an attacker walks up to my car and grabs the handle, he sees that it's locked, hopefully they'll move on to another car. If they're really motivated to break into my car and they try to jimmy the lock or break in or break the glass, then the alarm system should be the detection method or the, the compensating control that allows us me to know that the fact that they've broken into my car, right? So um, we can relate that to cyber defense and cyber detection systems. So you know, having firewalls and banners on, on your systems, when you log into a machine and it brings up a banner and says, you know, unauthorized users will be prosecuted, you know, those are all kind of like the locks on your car saying, hey, this is an uh, act access control method, you're not supposed to go past this. Now, if those, uh, those outer controls are defeated and someone does get on the inside and you need to have a detection system in place to back up your deterrent system, and in the logical cyber world, that usually involves intrusion detection systems and logging systems. So by, by having intrusion detection systems in place on the inside of your network, um, you can monitor abnormal uh, network performance uh, normal patterns that's happening on the machines, and those alerts can be sent to someone in the organization who is uh, being designated to be the first uh, line of defense. This also allows you to historically trend your system performance so you can see any uh, 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 abnormal use of the system. So look, let's look at the term cyber risk. Cyber risk commonly refers to any risk of a financial loss, disruption, damage, or reputation of an organization following from, resulting from the failure of its information systems. Um, so let's break down risk even further. Risk is not determined by threat motivation, right? So sometimes people will say, well, I don't have any cyber risk because why would someone want to target me, right? That's the wrong place to, to start from, from a, from a mindset. Because what we've seen is that over 90% of cyber incidents uh, you know, the victim wasn't even the target involved. You know, the, the, the uh, exploit was written and deployed on a network and it propagated onto other networks and systems that were, uh, uh, that were affected by that exploit, but they weren't even their initial target. So risk is really determined by a combination of system susceptibility. So basically unhardened or unmanaged assets the threat accessibility, so can the threat access that application or that server through a vulnerable architecture or weak configurations or a lack of technical controls. So basically if the system assets are vulnerable to exploitation, they've not been patched, they're misconfigured, you know, so there is a vulnerability present, the threat can access those assets with relative ease, then the system is at a high risk state. And this diagram kind of helps bring it in visually for us. So uh, this covers your system susceptibility. We can reduce this by reducing the number of vulnerabilities in our system, right? So by patching your systems on a, on a regular basis, by having the right logging systems in place, by doing preventive maintenance on your system, um, by, by also having physical security and having physical guards and cameras, you know, these are all reducing your system susceptibility. Um, you're, you can also reduce the ability of the threat to get access to those systems by putting additional controls in place in front of the threat. Um, we don't have control over the threat capability, right, because they're always developing new tools, new techniques, they're always accessing more resources, developing more exploits. So this is where we can really reduce our threat surface is up here at this top part. So lastly, now let's, let's focus on if I am able to detect that my system has been compromised, then what are the following procedures that I should follow uh, after? 
And let's keep in mind that it's everyone's responsibility to detect and report threats. Right? That's a, I took this picture myself when I was doing a security assessment. And so obviously this guy was falling down on the job. But uh, we don't want to be like that guy, right? It requires observant people, all of us working together to make sure that we uh, detect potential threats. On the physical side, here's some tips and techniques, right? So uh, break-ins by burglars are possible because of vulnerabilities in the security system. You know, sophisticated, sophisticated criminals uh, plan a burglary. You know, they know when you're there, when you're not there. They do dry runs, you know, to see what your response time is. You know, you know only opportunistic burglars act on the spur of the moment, right? So, um, in a majority of cases, commercial burglary is carried out because there are no proper detection in place. You know, they're missing uh, certain camera angles, so the criminals know they can get away with it. There's a gap between detection and response, right? So they've tried it a few times. They know that if the detection system goes off, the alarm sounds. Well, it's going to be 15 minutes before the cop arrives, so let's just put hoods on our faces, rob the place, and get out before the response time's there, right? So in, in other scenarios, you know, former employees will use their credentials to enter a company's facilities. So if, uh, if, if, if you don't quickly uh, take away someone's access controls to a facility, that's a, another gap in your physical uh, security program. Uh, how that relates to you guys would be, you know, a lot of these uh, treatment facilities and plants have fences with, you know, pin codes in it. They're, they're very simplistic, you know, like one, three, four, five, or, uh, or something. And when you no longer use a specific contractor or maybe an employee is fired, how often do you go back and remove all those different little physical dip switches and changes in all of your keys for all your cabinets, uh, you know, and change all of this more than just, you know, turning off their logical account access on their computer and their email. Any uh, physical access that they had or knowledge of pin codes or security keys, that all has to be changed as well. So if we continue down the physical side, be aware of coworkers and approved contractors in your workplace. Um, if you don't recognize a person that's in your workspace, uh, there's nothing wrong with asking for identification or asking them, hey, how are you doing? Um, can I help you with something, right? By putting someone on the spot, by asking them, that's going to make someone uh, feel uneasy if they're not supposed to be there. You can kind of read their response back to you. You know, be particularly wary of individuals that appear not to be familiar with their workspace. If they're walking down a hallway that's a dead end, or they're trying to uh, do a door that's locked, or they're trying to go in a place that doesn't have any uh, anything in that in that room, you know, you might want to say, "Hey, are you supposed to be in this part of the building, or are you, are you should be in the in here?" Uh, so, if you do see any suspicious activity, uh, report that to uh, uh, to the proper personnel in accordance with your organization's security policy. Um, because a lot of time it's, it's those individuals that are the first line of defense. On the cyber side, here's a couple of typical threats that we've talked about during this training. Uh, malware, you know, malicious software that gets into your computer and then starts to do other things than what was designated for that application. So this could be you know, scamware, spyware, Trojans. It could be mi mining uh, for cryptocurrency on your computer. Um, you know, those are all threats. Even though it may not be stealing information, it's slowing your computer down. It's harvesting resources from your system. Uh, phishing would be specific threats where an organization is trying to elicit a response from you to click on a link. Uh, when you click on that link, it will download a, a, a dropper onto your machine to allow them to have remote access to your machine. Or they may ask you to register for something, and by you putting in your username and password into that registration process, now they have what could be your actual username and password for your system. Uh, spear phishing is similar to phishing, although it's designated phishing for a specific personnel and organization. This would be uh, also called whaling. So this is for like specific CEOs or CFOs or high net worth people. They might be to have a specific targeted phishing attack, which would be a spear phishing attack. Uh, man in the middle attacks would be where uh, an attacker tries to intercept communications in the middle. Uh, sometimes this would be by planting devices in place. So if you're walking around your workspace and you see like you know the table's been pulled away from the, the, the wall and there's uh, a weird looking device with some antennas hanging off it, you probably should ask questions about that. 
Um, you, sometimes they'll plant devices out in a fenced area, out in a treatment facility, out in a lift station area. You see some weird random RF communications or antennas or hardware placed somewhere. It could be that someone's trying to do a man in the middle attack to basically scrape information from the system before it gets um, harvested by the back end. Trojans and ransomware, uh, this has been a real big problem this past year. Uh, this is basically, uh, well a Trojan would be any type of software that's disguised as something else. Ransomware would be another version of a, of a Trojan designated to uh, compromise data, encrypt data, and cause you to pay a sum of money in order to get your data back. Ransomware is a form of a Trojan, but it's been uh, designed in order to, to elicit a monetary response. Um, also, denial of service attacks, which are also called uh, DOS, or Distributed Denial of Service Attacks, which is DDOS. This is when a large number of machines harvest their bandwidth and their processing power all at once to overwhelm the, the bandwidth capabilities of a system. And that would be when, let's say, you go to someone's website and it's down, just because someone is doing a denial of service attack to that website. Um, you, there's also attacks on IoT devices, Internet of Things devices. And I know in our, our utility industry, we're starting to see a lot, a lot of uptake in smart meters and metering out at the home. And uh, as I talked to be, I talked to about this before, in terms of like Nest thermostats little personal security cameras, all these things are Internet of Things devices that all connect back to the home internet system. We need to make sure that those devices are installed properly, that the passwords, default passwords have been changed, and that their firmware has been updated with the latest firmware and the latest patches. Uh, data breach would be a security incident in, uh, specifically in where information is accessed illegally. Uh, uh, some of the latest breaches that we saw the last couple of years would be like, you know, the Target breach where, you know, millions of customers had identity theft just because data was leaking outbound from the point of sale devices. Um, having proper detection in place would prevent that by knowing when, when your outbound information traffic is, is going above the norm. And malware on mobile apps, and we talked about that before, you know, even device uh, applications on your smartphone can be compromised. So here's some uh, best practices and tips for identify, identifying these cyber threats. Uh, we talk a lot about email because that is still the predominant way that these threats are coming in. In fact, I think uh, they said over 72% of attacks that were ransomware were all came in through internal employees that clicked on emails they shouldn't have clicked on. So do not click on emails, do not come from verified sources. Be cautious and keep in mind potential phishing attacks. Um, do not insert USB sticks or mount portable hard drives in your work computer without following your procedures. Uh, make sure it's approved by your organization. Do not install applications on your smartphone or your tablet or your work computer or your, even your home computer unless it's approved by your organization. Especially if you're using your home computer to access your work through a VPN because anything that's on your home computer can now be uh, come through that VPN into your, your work network. So be cautious about installing applications. Uh, if a system or application starts to operate slower than normal, you should start to ask some questions, maybe report that through a help ticket or however you get your support for your systems. Uh, a lot of times, you know, a very slow device or slow application would be a telltale sign that it's been compromised. And report any suspicious activity uh, concerning your device or application following the the proper procedures of your organization. So as Jonathan had pointed out some uh, specific threats and how to respond to them, uh, in the public sector a lot of you guys are going to uh, encounter some of these things but not all of them, uh, but I wanted to make clear a few items that may be useful to you. Uh, Obviously, the emails are, are very sensitive, um, and as uh, we had mentioned before, if you're using your personal devices uh, to do any public business, that's generally discouraged anyway, and if it is sensitive and you are doing the same business on your personal devices, uh, not only does that increase the risk of threat, but it can also increase the likelihood of a public information request uh, uh, gaining access to your personal information. 
So if you're doing public business on your home PC or even your phone, be very mindful of that. Uh, the ideal scenario is to have dedicated hardware provided by your organization that can be professionally managed by not only an IT professional, uh, but uh, 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 you know, with well-established uh, communications policies, security policies, um, and a lot of these can be configured uh, in advance so that um, you, know, you don't have to necessarily be as mindful of some of these items because your environment's already been secured by your authorized personnel. Uh, another instance would be uh, if you are uh, seeing any of these threats and they are uh, obvious to you or you're starting to notice any of the byproducts or manifestations of any of, the, uh, any of these uh, bullet points that you've gone over, uh, please be sure that you report that to either uh, cybersecurity personnel, uh, your legal counsel, uh, your communications department, whatever the appropriate entity is, uh, to ensure that you're, you're being uh, diligent about uh, reporting any sort of uh, potential threats that you may observe uh, that, that could potentially put you guys at risk. So that concludes the end of our training. If you have any questions about any of the content or if there's any questions you have about adoptions of policies uh, and some professionals that you could get in touch with that might help alleviate some concerns or improve your organizational security standards, uh, we, are, we are available for questions and uh, we thank you for your time and uh, congratulations on completing the training.